Just to mention aliens turns some people off, but to a Christian, to a Catholic, thinking about extraterrestrial life can hold tremendous value. Stick with me for a minute. If you replace the word alien with the other, then we start down a familiar path. Does the other exist in the universe? Would the other wish us harm or peace? Should I will the good of the other? Some of the greatest Catholic thinkers wrestled with the question of the other. Whether you're thinking about so-called aliens or maybe creatures who live in the center of Earth or maybe people at the edge of the world, how we approach our theoretical brothers and sisters of the universe might tell us a lot about what our faith really means to us. Think about the psalmist, you know, looking up at the, yeah. the heavens and say, when I surveyed, you know, your handiwork, the stars you ordained, what is man that you should even think of him? Uh, or even the heavens are telling the glory of God that from earliest times, people have looked up into the heavens, especially at night and seen the stars in that. And though they had no idea just how vast it is that we're beginning to get a sense of, um, still those who are of faith, you know, were able to say, the one God I know who loves me and created me also created all this. And so it presses them to become even more full of wonder and adoration toward God and, and, and appreciation of who he is. Welcome to the Faithful Podcast, especially new listeners and hopefully subscribers. I'm your host, Tony Ganser, and today we'll explore the idea of extraterrestrial intelligence and the Catholic faith with the author of a book on that subject, Paul Thigpen. That's to come on Faithful. Nearly 15 years ago, I drove to a remote patch of Arizona desert under a bright moon, trying to keep an open mind. At the time, I was a public radio reporter in Phoenix, and I had heard about this man who made a fair bit of money in the swap meet game, and he invested $2 million to build a moonbeam collector. Tonight we're gathered for another moonlight beaming and hopefully heal people with it. Richard Chapin was the driving force behind construction of this five-story, 30-ton structure that looked like a giant chessboard with adjustable mirror squares. The structure was built to honor a friend who had died from cancer. And this friend believed that a frequency of moonbeams could affect a person's health. So in the desert, people suffering various afflictions would pile into a booth as these giant mirrors soaked them in an eerie white glow. If you just look at each other, you can see how brightly illuminated you are. Stay in the light and enjoy. As part of this story, I spoke with Dr. Larry Bergstrom, who at the time was head of the Mayo Clinic's Integrated Medicine Program in Scottsdale. He was a bridge between conventional and alternative medicine, and I would consider him a doctor with an open mind. The fear of all conventional physicians treating patients who have a serious medical problem and the patient becomes interested in alternative therapies is that that will divert them from effective conventional treatments. Some people believed in the moonbeam power, saying it cured their asthma or other ailments. Others just didn't have any more options. They were desperate. Dr. Bergstrom's overarching point was that so long as people continued with proven treatments and exploring unique alternatives didn't take away from solid treatment, then it was probably okay to go to this patch of desert and see what happens. I like to keep an open mind about our world, and for our episode today about life outside of our world, I'd like for us to think similar to what Dr. Bergstrom says. I think faithful Catholics are free to ask questions and explore existential issues, so long as we don't ignore the core tenets of our faith in search of some maybe remote possibility. Many Catholic thinkers have explored this question of alien life from an apologetic standpoint to the Vatican Observatory. And science fiction likes to return to this tension of space and religion every so often. 
In one classic episode of the original Star Trek series, the crew finds a planet with Roman-era government and a growing following of sun worshippers thought to be very primitive. But the sun, S-U-N, spoiler alert, was actually sun, S-O-N. And we're left with this question of whether Christ would die again on some distant cross for the same path of salvation for another species. And Christ, they had them both. And the word is spreading only now. Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, also had a show called Earth Final Conflict about a race of aliens who purportedly came to help out the humans. But in one episode, a character blends images of Moses, Jesus Christ, a few other historical figures, and the image looks just like this alien. Have they been here before? The souls of our two species have a long history on many different planes. Now this is science fiction. Do I believe this? No. But maybe our souls do have a unique connection to other beings. God's grace is certainly abundant enough to spread beyond the stars, isn't it? In December 2022, Pentagon officials said there was no evidence to affirm the existence of space aliens, but the search continues. So, our thinking about our faith and potential alien life can continue. Today with Paul Thigpen, author of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Catholic Faith from Tan Books, I asked him why now was the time for this book. My concern is that if we should get to the point, and I think it could happen soon, where there's either some kind of scientific discovery or official government disclosure that, yes, there is something out there that sure seems to be a non-human intelligence that we're having contact with. Um, I, I don't want Catholics and other Christians to kind of be caught off guard by that in the sense of thinking that somehow it's contrary to their faith, uh, that their faith cannot accommodate it. For centuries, we've had adversaries of the Christian faith try to claim that if ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence, is real, that it somehow disproves the Christian faith. So that's really the, the point of the book for a Catholic audience. It's kind of an apologetics book to say, no, Christian faith has accommodated all kinds of scientific discoveries in the past, like Copernicus, you know, understanding that the Earth's not the center of the universe. Um, we can accommodate this too. And even with scriptures that may seem to be relevant or not, catechetical passages, but especially by looking at the history of the conversation, the uh, this conversation about the possibility of life on other worlds has been going on since the ancient Greeks and Romans and has been been addressed by Catholic and other Christian theologians for centuries. So it's uh, I don't want us to be caught off guard, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you kind of lay out this. Um this double-edged sword of this topic, that on one hand, if you even bring up extraterrestrial life, people are saying, ah, this is, this is just too far out there. I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, but you do document early church fathers, uh, many philosophers who have wrestled with this idea of the unknown other. We don't know what that is. Is it in outer space? Is it at the edge of the world? We don't know what that is, but we're thinking about it, right? Yes. And, and in fact, you have uh, St. Albert the Great, who says it's, it's a marvelous thing to think about such a thing. Uh, whereas in our generation, I think there are historical reasons for it. We've tended to, the last two generations, to dismiss it with mockery and ridicule if people talk about it. That's really the, the anomaly historically. It's for 25 centuries, people, the best minds of Western society, culture, have considered the thing and, and said it's, it's an important issue to, to think about. Not that we can resolve it necessarily without actually have any experience of it. Mm -hmm. In addition to, to St. Albert, does anybody else uh, come to mind that you think, you know, Catholics should really pay attention to the thinking that's already been done within the faith? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, all, all the way back to St. John Chrysostom, for instance, you know, saying that just as it's easy for you to think about the possibility of other worlds out there, the universe, entire universes, that uh, for God, it's 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 easier not just to think about it, but to actually do it. And uh, and that's, you know, that's part of the theme you have throughout, is that God is God. He's, he's, he's all powerful. He's all creative. He can do these things. Now, is there anything that he has revealed to us that would say that, that he hasn't? 
uh, that that becomes the point of debate. But you have um, you have folks, oh goodness, that that look at the question of what we even call ultra ultra terrestrial life, the possibility that there's something else, non-human intelligence living on this earth. And of course, now we're not talking about demons and angels at this point. The Christian faith, of course, affirms that there are other there are non-human intelligences, but they're not embodied. Uh, but you have even have some interesting comments like Padre Pio is on record as saying, affirming, not just, it doesn't even sound like he's saying it's his opinion. Someone asked him, you know, what about like with other planets? And he says, yeah, of course there are. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think we're the only ones that give glory to God? And uh, and he even said in that same interview that um, that there were other races out there that were not fallen as we are. Now, that doesn't prove that it's true, but it does it does demonstrate that someone who knew the faith as, as well as he did, who was as holy and close to God as he did, did not see that to contradict his faith. Nor did Blessed Anne Cat Catherine Emmerich, the visionary, and blessed that so many people, you know, really enjoyed seeing her, hearing about her visions. She claimed to have seen life out there. Um, you have St. John Paul II, who, uh, when a little girl asked him in a public audience one time, uh, Holy Father, what about aliens? Yeah, he could have said, um, that's contrary to the faith. He could have said, we don't know. He could have said, if we find out, and then make a statement. But he didn't say any of those things. He just said very simply, they're God's children too. Um, so it's not like I'm trying to pit saint against saint there. But simply to say that, um, you know, I have just, just recently, again, someone has dismissed my book as somehow leading people into satanic stuff because uh, we all know it, it doesn't exist. It's contrary to the faith. And... Uh, if you're going to condemn, you know, the questions I'm asking at the point I'm making, you've got to put these other people I just mentioned on the same side. It's uh, it's really not true that it's contrary to our faith. The church has not defined anything about it. What would you say is the major obstacle um, in this space? Is it uh, thinking about humans and the fall, our relationship with God as wholly unique and somehow admitting that there are other beings in the universe that that would undercut our story is that the core of it or is it something else i think that's the most probably the most obvious one the, the last thing you said that uh for people who really thought about it, there are a lot of knee-jerk reactions out there that oh if i don't understand it, it's all demons you know and that happens a lot <laughs> um uh, more than you would like to believe but uh but i think what some people worry about is that it somehow undercuts our special relationship with God if we're not uniquely in the image of God. If there are others and other other planets and other places, then we're not special anymore. Um, and, you know, my, my reply to that is, is to recall what St. Augustine once said, that God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Mm. And anyone who's a parent of more than one child understands exactly what that means. You have your first child. You think, I love this child with all my heart. I could never love anybody more or as much as this. And then the second child comes along and you say, I love this child with all my heart. <laughs> I can never, that love doesn't get divided that way. It's multiplied. And when you are love yourself, God is love himself, infinite love. It would not divide his love at all to have other races that he, he loves. He could love each of those species as if there were only one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's one of the concerns um, you get, you know, simpler concerns like, well, it's not in the Bible, so it can't be. But of course, Microbes and molecules and dinosaurs and duckbill platypuses aren't in the Bible either, but we know they exist. The Bible's not intended to be an exhaustive scientific text of, of all of reality. And also Catholics aren't bound by sola scriptura since we don't believe in sola scriptura. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and we do, have, again, have this wonderful tradition within the church of discussion of it, of taking it seriously. Um, I think the other thing is, and I'm getting you know more of this, is... Uh, people concerned that it, just right, excuse me, writing it off is demonic, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a tendency you get. I mean, there was a time when we didn't we didn't understand you know, illnesses, and would write off you know someone who was who's schizophrenic or something or hearing voices as demonic. And that's not to say that there are there probably are plenty of people who've been diagnosed that way who are having demonic problems. I've written extensively on spiritual warfare, um, but to just say okay, it's all that way, you know, no, that's that's not true. So it's simple illness. The more we understand the science of it, the better the better off we are. And I think it's a similar thing here. People don't don't understand it. It's unusual. Uh, it's not helped by the fact that you have some people claiming 
abduction, so-called abduction experiences by aliens and going through all kinds of terrible things. And I do, I do agree that in some of those cases, almost certainly it's something demonic. Um, the parallels between what they experience and and uh, what we the church normally sees as a demonic encounter are so close. Even secular observers have noted the parallels. So no, I don't discount that at least some of it is, but to paint with a broad brush and say everything having to do with the possibility of ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence, or even sightings in the sky and that kind of thing. Um, most of the majority of this doesn't fit that demonic pro uh, profile at all. Um, and if, you know, there are more and more people who are claiming, and, and maybe the government's close to finally admitting that there have actually been crashed UFOs and we've retrieved materials from them to study. Um, if that's the case, how in the world would that fit demonic stuff? I mean, I can imagine demons kind of causing a light apparition in the sky or something, but if you've got some physical material in your hand that came from a craft that's been around for 70 years. Um, we'd be hard pressed to fit that into some kind of demonic, you know, pattern or explanation. Yeah. Uh, as you say, you wrote a manual on spiritual warfare. Um, and I, I wonder how you would explain more of a willingness even to enter a conversation about angels and demons than it seems sometimes to talk about other life in the universe or other kinds of life, because even angels have taken on a sort of a, a mythical creature status uh, among new wave uh, and new age religions. So why is that more acceptable maybe than than aliens? Well, you know, it depends again on the audience. Uh, yeah. You have, uh, it is interesting. Um, uh, the theologian who wrote a uh, Christology text that his name is escaping me right now, but was teaching at, I think, Catholic University of America. Uh, I used it with some of my, my undergrad students in a Christology course. And he has a whole chapter on this possibility of extraterrestrial mm -hmm. intelligence. He's very open to it, you know, that kind of thing. But he makes a comment there where he thinks that our states that in the kind of secular world, as we've pushed angels out of the picture, um, it's it's made it uh, more and more. Uh, unlikely for people to be able to imagine anything else out there. Mm -hmm. And I think you could also say that in a world where, where we know for sure that there are intelligent creatures of God who are in certain ways at least higher than um, lower than him, of course, where we've ruled all that out, then what happens is we've left a vacuum, a natural vacuum, where the popular imagination, hungry for such things, you know, can can turn to that and start looking looking for creatures that way. And and that's not at all what I'm doing. You know, I've, 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 I'm a convert. I know my faith well, and and I love the angels, and they're my companions. And so there's not been a vacuum for me in that way. It's not like I'm looking, as some people are, they call it the ETI myth, looking to our space brothers who will come and save us from ourselves. Not, you know, not at all that. But I can understand how people without our faith might begin thinking that way, uh, because there is still this transcendent longing within us for for something beyond ourselves. And that's an easy thing to grasp if you can somehow claim it's just scientific. Yeah. You know, you alluded earlier to um, the fact that people claiming they've been abducted kind of hijacks the conversation in, in some ways. <clears throat> that There could be many reasons they're claiming this. Um, and you see it within, you know, conspiracy theories every once in a while that people will say any religion stems from aliens who have visited the planet. Mm -hmm. And even going down this train of thought is kind of exhausting because it, it throws out, <laughs> you know, the whole of, of human philosophical and theological development. Uh, do you think that's part of the issue of, of having a mature conversation about just possibilities and, and our role in the universe is this idea that it's been hijacked to some degree? I think so. I, and I see that all across the board, even just in the more general issue when you have a lot of folks now who have grown up in a secular culture, which is philosophically materialist, you know, which is to say yeah. energy and matter is the whole thing. There's nothing beyond. There's nothing spiritual, no soul, no spirit, no God, no angels or demons, no life after death. And in examining this issue, you hear them coming out and saying, I'm no longer a materialist. This is not fitting that paradigm. And what else is out there? And then they 
it's as if they wouldn't dare touch, go back to the Christian notion and say, oh, maybe there's a God. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. uh, instead, they have to find some other explanation. And uh, so I was, you know, listening to, to a broadcast the other night and they were talking about, well, you know, we, we've got this evidence now statistically that evolution on this earth with our species went extremely rapidly fast compared to what it should have been simply by random chance. It's almost as if there was a cosmic push. And then immediately you have some folks jumping in and say, see the aliens, we're manipulating our, right. <laughs> our genetics. But I want to say, guys, no, I mean, what's the simple explanation? That there's a God yeah. behind it. But it's not, <laughs> even if it looks random to us, he had a plan. It's a very messy thing. And that's one of the reasons I felt they had to write the book, to try to have at least one voice that, you know, that's, that's not sensationalist, that's, that's trying to be sane, that's... that's faithful as far as I can see it and you know and I know Catholic doctrine really well I'm a historical theologian you know a PhD in that I'm faithful I'm a convert so don't take any of that for granted I say in the book if the church should say at any point no this is not true this is it I'd submit to it um, but for a voice like that to be able to start offering getting people to think about the possibility that this this kind of disclosure happens then it doesn't destroy our faith we'll have questions we need to answer but uh, it won't, and so I'm, I'm I'm just offering it, you know, that way for for people. And uh, if things continue going as they are, the Congress, they, there may be more people looking for this book. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, at the core, to me, this seems like part of human longing, as you said, just mm-hmm. to discover our place in existence. Because really, why are we alive? Uh, what are we searching for? That's kind of the fundamental question that we all face. And from a Catholic perspective, we certainly have the truth as as we understand it. But people who don't have the in- entirety of the faith uh, are looking for answers elsewhere. So whether you talk about planets or multiverses or, or heaven and hell, it seems like at the core, it's trying to understand who we are and, and what we're doing. Do you think that's fair? Oh, yeah. I mean, you Think about the psalmist, you know, looking up at the, yeah. the heavens and say, when I surveyed, you know, your handiwork, yeah. the stars you've ordained, what is man that you should even think of him? Uh, or even the he- heavens are telling the glory of God that from earliest times, people have looked up into the heavens, especially at night, and mm-hmm. seen the stars in that. And though they had no idea just how vast it is that we're beginning to get a sense of, um, still, those who are of faith, you know, we're able to say the one God I know who loves me and created me also created all this. And so it presses them to become yeah. even more full of wonder and adoration toward God and, and, and appreciation of who he is. For those who would have been pagans, you know, the temptation was, oh, well, actually, Venus is a goddess and Mars is a god and Jupiter is a god. And, you know, to, to see that way. And that's part of what the gospel was to kind of demythologize that stuff yeah. and say, all those are great. And, and of course you have this transcendent longing, but every one of those were made by the one true God. Mm. And, um, and that's one of the reasons that, that too. I mean, I, I started out kind of as an apologetic spoken that remained that, but I discovered that looking at a number of the issues here, if you look at them seriously, they will press you to delve more deeply into the mysteries of our faith to look more more closely and understand more deeply what is the image of God, you know, in, in the human race. And uh, what was the nature of the incarnation for, for the second person of the Trinity to take to himself a human nature. And uh, and more things about eschatology and the, the end, end of things and, and, and the nature of salvation, how God accomplishes it. Every one of those things you have to delve in deeply. And in the book, what I discovered is there are some Christian theologians out there, not necessarily Catholics, but uh, who are looking at this and the things they're throwing out there uh, end up leaning towards some of the ancient heresies. Mm -hmm. But nobody's nobody's called it out, you know, and I'm not trying to call it out in a bad way. But there are some folks, for instance, they they seem to, without realizing, have fallen into the Nestorian heresy about what the nature of the incarnation and others who just right off the bat deny original sin and others who. they're just saying things like, you know, if you looked at the early Christian controversies and what the, what the church did say and teach, it would guide through, you through this conversation in a really important way. So there's my faith is deeper than ever after writing this book and researching. Wow. Um, 
you you reference this, but um, in in closing, I wonder if you can talk a little more about how much this really matters in in mm. the core of Catholic faith, because whether or not we are alone, whatever that means in in existence. Um, we are called to follow Christ's example, to walk his path toward the one true God. That's what we're called to do as Catholics. Um, so whether or not we're alone, that doesn't change what was delivered from God himself, right? It doesn't. And and that's why, you know, someone could just never pay attention to this issue at all. And still, <laughs> as they have, you know, some of many, uh, be a, a faithful Catholic and, a, you know, saint in the making. Um, again, if if we in the next year or so should begin to have public disclosures. I mean, there are even groups of scientists now are finally taking this seriously, putting up yeah. all kinds of instruments to find it. Avi Loeb at uh, Harvard and some others. Um, so that if there should, you know, should what they say, you know, we really, here's what it's, we, we got it. That's think about the possibilities will press you in your own life to number one, more toward humility. Mm. Is it, it has certainly for me, that uh, because we can sometimes be kind of arrogant about you yeah. know who we are, and it compresses toward wonder, which uh, which I I define as humility in the face of mystery, more toward wonder of God and appreciation of just how great He is, and how magnificent His His plans for us, and um, how marvelous His ways. It, it can send you back to the Book of Job. I quote it, you know, in there, where Job is trying to. Talk as if he has God's, you know, ways figured out. He's he's putting God on trial. So why don't you do this, this, and this? And God comes back and says, "Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? And uh, are you the one who put the 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 Pleiades, you know, the stars out there, and Orion up there? Did you do that?" And Job has to say, "I repent and dust to ashes." And uh, it's a uh, it's a good thing, you know, to to think about those and that they were so much more to God than we can know at this point. Uh, praise God for you know. They get to the beatific vision in heaven that we will know as he knows. And he will give a share of his knowledge and everything else in his nature with us. That's, uh, that's what the beatific vision is all about. Uh, but until then, it's a it's a great thing to have some humility and wonder about it. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of mystery still. Yeah. And, and we're discovering answers uh, <laughs> one step at a time on the pilgrim journey, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. My thanks to Paul Thigpen, author of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Catholic Faith. I hope you found this conversation at least interesting, and if nothing else, gave you something to think about as you consider your own faith here and now on this planet. And wherever you are, please have a great day.